All right, welcome to lab three. This is another three week lab, so I'm gonna take a while to explain everything, but I promise it will be worth it. So let's get started with some new C++ stuff. A new concept, uh, most likely for you, is this thing called an enum. Uh, it stands for enumeration, and it's a way of making your own types. It's a different way. It's where you spell out everything that's in a type. So I'm gonna give you an example of ice cream flavors, and we can make an ice cream type that is only inhabited, we say, by these members of it. Like, ice cream can be vanilla, chocolate, it's customary to use capitals, uh, and then strawberry. And we can go crazier, but I'm gonna say that this is all. This is all that ice cream could possibly be. It can be one of these three things, but nothing else, okay? So it's kind of like using strings, so kinda like strings, but more guarantees. And I'll show you why. Uh, there should be a T there. Because sure, you could say, yes, string my flavor. Equals vanilla and do all the same stuff. Then this thing I'm about to teach you in enum. Sure that you can do that. But you could also go around and set flavor to something that wasn't in this type, something that you do not want to consider, like, I don't know, uh, sherbet. You could do that with a string, but you can't do it with an enumeration because sherbet's not in here. Okay, that's the idea. That is the point, and it's wonderful. Okay, so in enum, if we go to this page, it talks a bit more about it. It gives a, a more standard example. Uh, where is it? There it is. Enumerated types. Uh, this is the syntax. You say enum, name of the type, all the stuff that goes inside of it, and then uh, a semicolon, eventually. <laughs> so here's one that's making all the colors. They want to consider only these colors. Okay, and that's what it means to be a type. And these are like your identifiers that exist now. They're like little variables that make up this type, colors T. Okay, so let's do that for, uh, for ice cream flavors, and that'll be that. So here's my enums.cvp file. Let us make a brand new type called flavors. So every ice cream flavor is one of these. Okay, so that semicolon is necessary. And then you give all the things that it could be inside. Vanilla, chocolate, and strawberry. Okay, so that is my enumeration. These are the three things, these are the three kinds of flavors that I'm allowing you to have. I can say ice cream flavor. It's a brand new type, just like a struct. Uh, Lawton's favorite. I am boring, I like vanilla. Okay, maybe my cat loves chocolate. But you can just use these now. These are little identifiers that are elements of this ice cream flavor type. It's like a little cloud that you made for yourself. And these are the three things that you could put in this type, okay? And ice cream flavor can be one of those three things and you can check them. Like if Lawton's favorite is equal to Lonzo's favorite. So out the same, you can reset them. You can do all that you want. Uh, without having to worry about the following happening, because you could have used strings just as easily, probably. The reason you don't is because you can't do something like this. You can't say, you can't make a thing that doesn't exist, okay? Unde undeclared use, or use of undeclared identifier. We don't like that, okay? So this is not allowed, and that's what enums give you. These uh, in an ice cream flavor can be one of these three things, but nothing more. This won't work because it wasn't part of the enumeration. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense. We're gonna be using enums. It's a very simple concept. Uh, it's a lot easier than a struct or a class, that's for sure, but uh, it's probably something you haven't seen yet. Okay, so that's an enum. Hey. 
And now on to the main part. So hash tables, what, what are those things? Let's remember them. Okay, so a hash table is just a glorified lookup table. Remember that it is, in essence, deep down, it is a big, long array of things. And everything, of course, has an index, like this is zero, this is one, this is two, this is 42. And uh, you want to put stuff in these indices because you want to save them for later. You want to map keys to values, okay? So like uh, a phone book is a very good example of a hash table. I want to map John Smith to, uh, apparently this is John Smith's phone number. And the idea is this key was not a number yet, but in my array deep down, I need number indices. How in the world am I, am I going to convert a string key to a number index? And the answer is with these things called hash functions. So hopefully this is all coming back to you from 41. Please yell at me in office hours if you have questions about this stuff. I would be happy to explain, uh, but I'm going to go kind of fast because this should be uh, something you've learned. So uh, yeah, if you've seen, uh, you've seen maps, that's for sure, in C++. And those are technically not hash tables. They're using binary search trees. Unordered maps, though, those are using real hash tables in C++. So if you've used that, you've used a hash table. And uh, yeah, the, the main idea with a hash table is you need to convert that key to a number so that you can make a index in your lookup table. It needs to map to like, John Smith needs to map to two, Lisa Smith needs to map to one, etc. Okay, so uh, that number essentially tells you where in the lookup table to put the value that you're trying to put. Okay, and uh, except when it doesn't, <laughs> that's the idea. Because sometimes there will be collisions, okay? There will be collisions and you can't do that, except when collisions happen. So maybe John Smith maps to one, uh, or maps to two, but also Lawton maps to two. And oh man, hash function, how dare you? You're trying to map two things to the same place. Obviously, you can't put two things in the same bucket we have to figure out how to fix this, okay? Uh, and there are two ways. The way that I teach in my 41 class is uh, open hashing. I spend a lot of time on that there. And so instead of putting one thing in a bucket, uh, put a list of things in a bucket so that you can put as many things as you would like there. So Lawton can come right after it. That's the idea. Uh, alternatively, uh, and this requires an extra list, but it is, uh, it's a very good way of doing things. Alternatively, and in a number theoretic way, which is why I'm going to do it in this way in this class, you can use closed hashing. So uh, hopefully you've seen this as well in 41. And that idea is you are forced to store everything in the table itself. You can't have extra lists sitting outside. This is uh, that's an example of open hashing. Closed hashing means you have to put your thing somewhere in the table, but somewhere else, okay, if it's already being used. If this slot is used, you need to find a, a new one to store Lawton and its value, okay? So that is closed hashing. You have to store the elements in the hash table itself, and you'll be implementing a fancy way of closed hashing in this lab, okay? Uh, so the idea is you're going to go to the first spot. You're going to go to where your hash function thinks that this thing should be stored. This key needs to be mapped to index 2, apparently. But oh man, index 2 is in use. Your next step is to search for an empty spot somewhere else in the table. And there are easy ways to do it, just like, okay, uh, look at the next one, look at the next one. And there are fancier ways to do it, okay? And these are called probing strategies, ways to look for a new place in the table to store your key that unfortunately collided, okay? That is the idea. Okay, so uh, the easiest way of probing is what's called linear probing. So you're just gonna look at the next slot if the first one that you're trying to get to is full, okay? So let me give you a silly example because this is really what's going on. This is your hash table and maybe your keys are integers and your values are strings, at least they will be for this lab. So let's say you want to insert uh, like, 55 and my name. Okay. So you're going to look up in your hash function. Let's call h our hash function. You're going to say h of 55 because that's your key. And maybe that's going to take you to index zero of the table. 
Okay, so it's like, okay, go there if it's empty, and it is right now, so let's put 55 and lot in there. The first key thing, no pun intended, that I want to say here is that you have to store the key as well as the value because of the fact you might have collisions. You don't know what was stored there otherwise. Okay, you have to save the key and the value everywhere, no matter what. Okay, will this work without? No, never mind. You have to save them both in the table. Otherwise, you have no clue where you're going. Okay, and you also have no clue when to stop when you're searching. So I'll, sh I'll show you that some more later, maybe. But this is my idea. This is my table, and 55 Lawton is something that I've in uh, inserted. And so now I know if I want to search for this, I'll search for the key, 55. And it'll get hashed to here. And oh man, the key matches. So here's the value that you're looking for. Hopefully this is all coming back to you. Uh, so for linear probing, you have this concept of i, where i starts out being 0 when you're first looking for something. So, so it's like you just look at h of key, first of all. But if you don't find the thing, if there is a collision, maybe you're trying to insert 56 and Lonzo, my cat, maybe h of 56, for some weird reason, also gives you 0. That's when the probing strategy kicks in. You tried the first one, i was 0, you tried h of key. No, it's full. Darn. Uh, in that case, you need to look ahead somewhere. You need to find a new slot. Oops. And linear probing just says to look at the next one. Look at the next one. And this is the formula that gives you that, because then you're going to increment i the first time you don't find it. So now i is 1, and you're going to look at the slot, the one that you originally wanted to go to, plus 1 mod n. So you wrap around if necessary. Okay, so that's the idea. So boop, boop, boop. Okay, that's how it's going to work. So uh, if the hash function takes you here, you're going to increment your i until you find like an empty slot. Okay, there's the empty slot. I'm going to put 56 Lonzo there. Okay, that's the idea of linear probing. Now, quadratic probing. Uh, Oh, maybe I should talk about this. No matter the probing strategy, you can look. Uh, you can stop looking when you find an empty slot. Okay, so uh, that's the idea. You're just looking for something empty. That's that's all I'm trying to say there. And quadratic probing is a fancier way of doing things because you might have like let's pretend this was a very long table now. You might have a bunch of things mapping right in a row. Maybe everybody starts getting mapped to zero for some reason. Uh, then you're going to keep on looking. It's going to take you longer to find an empty spot each time. Quadratic probing tries to solve that problem by uh, using two special constants that you define when you're uh, implementing the table, and uh, then you use the same i's and you start jumping around the table a whole lot and wrapping around, of course, still. Uh, so that is the beauty of quadratic probing. It's just a fancier way to jump around. But uh, a problem with quadratic probing is sometimes when the table is like half-ish full, you're going to miss places. You're going to wrap around, get to where you started, and think that there are no empty slots when there might have been. So quadratic probing is uh, technically faster than linear probing, but it also can skip some slots, which we don't like. Okay, So the solution, the solution where we would like to jump around so that we don't have a bunch of places, uh, we don't have like a traffic jam, is to use two hash functions. To double up, use this thing called double hashing, which is going to allow us to jump around the table in a kind of random way, which is beautiful. Okay, so again, here's my table. 0, 1, and 2. The idea here is, uh, sure, I'm trying to insert 55 Lawton. Uh, I can do that just as normal because h1, the first hash function, takes precedence, and this is the hash function I've implemented for you in this lab. So it's like, okay, h of 55. Apparently, let's pretend that goes to 0. It's not going to, I don't think, uh, in this example. But let's pretend it does. And so then we'll put 55 lot in there again, just as normal. Our first slot was empty that we were looking for. We're golden. Now is where the fun part happens. Let's pretend we wanted to insert uh, 56 Lonzo again. And let's pretend h of 56 again, or this is h1 now, of 56 takes us to 0. Now we want to jump around, because 
we don't want to like look at the next slot look at the next slot that takes time when it's very full so we try this h2 and that's going to tell us how much to jump each time we jump around it's going to be different for every key because h2 is a function it's not a constant like it was for quadratic probing okay so this is this might have been glossed over when you learn 41 but now i'm telling you all the nitty-gritty details uh, because uh, we now know number theory and h2 the second hash function is usually involving primes which we are now very familiar with okay primes and modular arithmetic as well so uh, i've also implemented this for you don't worry too much about it but h2 tells you now how much to jump around maybe h256 is 2 so that's going to tell us when the key is 56 jump around by 2 okay so now it's uh like 0 plus i times 2 for each round so the first place I'm gonna look is 0 oh man there's a collision I'm gonna skip one and jump ahead to looking at index 2 that's the new that's the next slot I'm going to look at okay and that's the idea hopefully that's gonna make some sense and uh, yeah if that one was apparently full I jump two more to 0 and 1 by wrapping around and you see how I'm gonna visit everybody too that's the beauty of it I'm guaranteed to if I pick the numbers right if there are primes involved okay so uh, and then 56 Lonzo would go here so that is double hashing I hope it's making sense for you you just have two hash functions and this is the next index that you try you're still using I but you're using two hash functions of your key and uh, of course mod n because you want to stay inside the table and yeah thanks to the magic of prime numbers which is the way we're going to use the second hash, fu hash function you are guaranteed to visit every index in the table in a different order for each key it's beautiful so not only are there not going to be traffic jams but for each key you're going to jump around in a different way which really really avoids problems okay and uh, it is possible though to try every slot and they're all full so uh, make sure to stop looking after you visited all n nodes in the table okay all n elements so that is closed hashing uh, that's double hashing you're gonna implement this okay now let me tell you why it's not the easiest thing to implement uh, removal is a problem so no matter the probing strategy when you're using closed hashing removal is a problem maybe you had like 5 L uh, 6 Z 7 M or something so these were your keys and values in your table tables full yeah removal says okay I can delete this thing but what if let me let me say like H of uh, let's pretend we're doing linear probing H of 6 was 0 so whenever I want to look up 6 in the hash table I'm gonna go look at 0 first and if it's empty I'm gonna think that it wasn't there like 6 cannot possibly exist the tables empty here so removal ruins everything when you remove things after you've add them after you've added them you need to keep searching after you see it because 6 is over here okay that is a problem okay hopefully you have read about this a little bit at least in 41 so the idea with removal is you have to keep searching after you see an empty slot if you know that empty slot has been made empty after having held something uh, before it okay so it used to be like there's a dotted line here for like five and L okay but it's no longer there that's the that's the unfortunate thing so uh, without removals life is a lot easier but now we need to be able to mark we need to mark that this was empty but not since the beginning empty after we removed something okay empty after removal we have to mark every single index now with this kind of status okay that's the way we solve this problem a table entry can be empty since start empty after removal or filled with an actual value so these two are currently filled okay And if you have an empty, uh, another empty slot, maybe you'd say this one is empty since start. It's never held anything. So these are the ways, uh, this is exactly what you're going to implement now. Every table entry has a key, a value, and uh, a status. Okay, that's going to allow you to implement everything.
So here is how you do it. Uh, I encourage you to look at your textbook for 41 because that's where uh, it's going to like give you pseudocode for everything. But let me just tell you at a high level how to do everything. I've also implemented, or I've also given you a ton of comments, of course. So insertion is hop around using your probing strategy until you find an empty slot. And either kind of emptiness is fine. It could be empty since start. Empty since start is fine. You can put something there. You can also do empty after removed. Uh, empty after removal. That's totally fine to put something there too because it's still empty. Okay, You can put something in any kind of empty slot. So just use your probing strategy uh, to find an empty slot. And if it's either kind of empty, you can put something there. Insertion. Okay, Removal. Also easy. If you have something here, like, uh, I don't know, 42L, if it existed, it's currently filled, you can just change that to empty. But it has to be empty after removal. Because if it was empty since start, uh, you're going to unfortunately stop your search a little too early. Uh, so all you have to do is go in at that uh, search for the key and make it empty after removal. Okay. Maybe let's do it like this. Yeah. So that's that's the one thing. You just have to change its status to know that it's gone. Uh, and then search is what removal ruins because now rem search takes a while uh, to explain. So you have to hop around if you're searching for something in your table. Let's pretend we're linear probing. Maybe we have, uh, I don't know, 42L. This is empty after removal. And this is uh, 50, uh, I don't know, 55R. OK, if we're searching for 55R and we got sent to 0, Let's pretend that like h1 of 55 is equal to 0, and also h2 of 55 is equal to 1. So this will give us linear probing starting at 0. If you want to search for 55, it's here. We have to give back r. That's the value that's stored there. We have to jump over anything that's empty after removal. Okay? You keep on hopping around until you find either a filled element with the correct key or if this was like 56 instead, an empty sense start. Okay? If you ever find an empty sense start, uh, sorry, element of the table, then you can stop searching because you would have put your 55 there if it really existed in the table. So you didn't find the thing, or you stop when you find it. Okay? Uh, you keep looking when you see empty after removal because something used to be there, now it's gone. We don't know if it was the thing that you were looking for or if it comes later. And then you also keep looking when you see a filled element that wasn't yours. Okay? Not the one that you're looking for. And finally, if you visited, like if the table's full and you visited all end nodes and you didn't find the thing, then you can also stop. Okay? So this is the hardest part. Search slash lookup is the hardest uh, method for this hash table class that we're going to be implementing because of removal. That ruins everything. Okay, so now we're ready to go over the write-up. Uh, hopefully you just watched me at twice the speed if you already knew this, but uh, hopefully it was helpful if you uh, are a bit fuzzy on this topic. So um, the write-up doesn't have a whole lot because I explained most of it in this uh, set of slides. Uh, just get the starter code as usual. Here they all are. You're going to be implementing hashmap.cpp. The name of the class is hashmap. Okay, so you're going to implement that. Uh, ints are keys, strings are values, and uh, everything was declared in hashmap.h. You're going to be implementing it in hashmap.cpp. That's the idea. I do encourage you to use your CSI 41 textbook if you still have it. That is probably all you need for this lab. It should have a section on double hashing. Uh, Outside of a textbook, here is a little link with double hashing. It has a little implementation. Of course, it's slightly uh, different to uh, the things that I'm making you do, but it should be a very good uh, resource to review things. It doesn't have removal, though, but removal is pretty easy. Uh, let's see here. Yeah, just compile as usual, run as usual, and once you got the test passing, uh, that's exactly what I'm going to test you for on the autograder. 
Okay, so uh, now I want to look at the code because uh, that's the last thing I should explain. Okay, so here it is over here. Uh, here are all the files. Hashmap.h is this. Eee. So here's our status. Here is the kinds of things you're going to store inside a hash table. Here is your triple of things, your key, your value, your status. Okay, that's all that you're going to be putting in your hash table. Okay, so it has to be filled with a key, a value, and a status. Hopefully that's making sense. And then HashMap is the class that uh, uses a hash table data structure. So here's the actual table. It's a vector filled with those items. Okay. And then we have all of these little methods. So the constructor is going to make the hash table. Insert's going to insert a key value pair. Uh, check if a key exists in the table. Uh, get the value for a key in the table if it's there. Uh, remove a key value pair from the table by going to the key and getting rid of it, uh, setting it to empty after removal. And then we have some private helper functions just for ourselves. Uh, is prime is going to be necessary. You can just copy that over. These two are your hash functions that I've implemented for you. And then you have find empty index, which is a helper for when you're trying to insert something. And then find index of key is a helper for when you're trying to look up something. Okay. And then your two member variables are the actual hash table and uh, a prime number p that is smaller than the table size, uh, which you'll be finding. Okay, so that is the header. And now here is all you're going to be doing. Okay, just implement every fix me and you're done. It's again, not a ton of code, but it's a lot to wrap your head around. So that's why I'm giving you three weeks. Okay, so yeah, for the constructor, I'm already initializing the table to the proper size. You should then go and set the member variable p to be the first prime that you find that's smaller than size. That's the best thing that you could put there. Okay, so that's your job. Find the first prime smaller than size and set the member variable p to that, that prime that you find. And you'll, of course, use this function. Okay, so use that method to do that. Uh, hash1 and hash2 are exactly as I had in the slides. You don't have to touch them. You just have to use them. Okay, uh, find empty index finds an empty index in the hash table. So you got to find something that's not yet filled. And this is essentially your lookup. Okay, look up from the slides. Okay, use that probing strategy as usual. And uh, you can assume that there's going to be at least one empty index when this method is called in my tests. Uh, I'm not going to try and hurt you too bad with that. Uh, so you're not going to have to worry about implement loops if you do it right. Uh, and then find an index of key is the next one. Again, you're going to be using a probing strategy, the same one, to look for the key now. See if it exists in the table. So you're going to start at hash one of key plus i times uh, plus zero times hash two of key. So you're just going to look here. That's your first index to look. And if you don't find it, you're going to increment i as usual. So you've got to keep looking if it's empty after removal. Stop looking if it's empty since start. But also stop looking if the table's full. Okay, this is where I don't want you to run into infinite loops. Okay, so uh, if the table is completely full, you can stop looking after you visited everybody. So that many entries in the table. You're going to jump around, so you're going to visit them out of order. But if you visit them all at the end, you can stop. Okay, because that thing that you were looking for obviously wasn't there. Hopefully that's making some sense. Please yell at me, of course. Come to office hours, yell at me on Discord. I'm happy to help. Uh, insert is going to be using uh, find empty index. Okay, that's essentially what you'll be doing. Uh, alternatively, though, if the key already exists, insert should update the value there. Okay, that's another thing. Otherwise, you'll use the normal stuff. You'll use find empty index and uh, insert a new key value pair in the empty slot and make sure to set the status of that slot, no matter what it was before, to be filled now. Uh, then exists. You can probably use a helper function to implement that. Uh, at goes to a key and returns the value. You can just return the value itself. It'll automatically be made a reference. That's so that you can change it. Uh, if it's negative one, you can just let it throw an exception. That's fine. Just go to the index where uh, find index takes you to. And then removal is uh, the last one. It's very easy. Just find the index. Go to the place in the table of the key you're trying to get rid of, like. Uh, if it was this one, just go there and just mark it empty after removal and you're done. Okay. 
you'll skip it in your search functions if you implemented those correctly. That's the idea. There's no need to change the value or anything. You just set it to empty after removal and call it a day. Okay, so that is my long-winded explanation of this lab. It's a three-week lab, so I, I think I get away with that this time. Uh, so that is everything. Okay, you'll run these tests. I have a very simple one and then a very difficult one that like fills up the table entirely and makes sure everything is in the proper spot. Uh, so just get both of those tests to pass and then you get full credit, okay? So please yell at me if you have any questions at all. I think that is everything that I wanted to say. So good luck on this. Uh, turn it in, it's due in three weeks. Should have plenty of time. Uh, and yeah, just yell at me if you have any questions as usual. So that's all I got for you and I will see you next week.